Welcome to a Date with Darkness podcast, where I will be discussing the impact of hurtful and abusive relationships and how to overcome them so that you can move through your pain and get to the kind of healthy relationships you want, need, and deserve. I'm Dr. Natalie Jones. I'm a licensed psychotherapist based in California. While I hope that you find this podcast educational and informational, please note it should not be substituted for treatment with a licensed mental health professional. Also, due to the nature of the podcast, some of the information presented on the show can be sensitive to some of my listeners. So please note that listener discretion is advised. Hello and how are you? Um, so excited to be sitting here with you today. So I have another great show planned for today uh, with a special guest that I found on TikTok um, that is just as passionate as talking about abuse, narcissistic abuse as I am. And she has some great videos on TikTok. Um, And then, you know, she also did, um, you know, I felt like the interview was great in that she shared um, so much of her experience, um, and, you know, as psychologists, as therapists, it's, you know, it's not really encouraged for us to openly disclose so much about our personal lives and our personal background. Uh, but, uh, Dr. Carrie McAvoy, who's going to be the guest on the show today, did just the opposite of that. She opened herself Um, She shared a perfectly relatable experience Um, and she and I, we talked about it afterwards and I, I really, I'm really am impressed with how she shared her story and how open and vulnerable um, she was about sharing her story. And, you know, when you've been a victim of abuse or you've been in, you've been in a situation, there's so much shame around talking about mistreatment that we've experienced um, because a lot of times when you've been a victim of abuse, you you're made to feel ashamed. You're made to feel crazy. Like it didn't happen. And sometimes you're re-victimized and made to feel like you did something to deserve it. And so it's not easy for people to share, um, you know, about their situation, give all, given all the nuances and just judgments that people have about each other. So I really appreciate that Dr. McAvoy came on and shared, and I'm sure that, you know, with a lot of the listeners out there, there's a part of you that can relate to her experience as a woman who was seeking out love. Um, All right. And so without further ado, here's my interview with Dr. Carrie McAvoy. Hello and welcome to the show, Dr. Carrie. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for inviting me today. I appreciate that. Of course, of course. I found you on TikTok, but I'd love for you to tell the world who you are and what you do and the passion behind your work. Oh, thank you. Well, I'm Dr. Carrie Kerr McAvoy. I am a licensed psychologist with over 20 years of counseling experience, but I actually retired my practice in 2015 when my uh, husband of 31 years passed away from cancer. So we got the devastating news that he was dying of a rare terminal kind of uh, malignancy. And as a result, I focused on his care and then found myself a, a newly, a new widow in my early fifties, which was a really big shock. So I made I made a big transition in the sense that I got married, but I ended up marrying a narcissistic sociopath, spent <laughs> two years in the marriage, three years altogether in the relationship. When I got out, uh, you know, I was in this huge swell of trauma and shock and trying to make sense of what happened and how it happened. How could I, as a psychologist, have gotten into this devastating, this dangerous relationship with somebody and then began mm. my my course of healing and in my course of healing uh started writing immediate I, I was already a writer a blogger i started writing my story and then really unpacking what narcissistic abuse is and realizing that the field of psychology has been woefully bl- behind on this topic mm-hmm. and just to clarify the husband who passed away from cancer is not the narcissistic sociopath okay exactly yeah, no, um, he was not. No. <laughs> All right. And no. I just wanted to clarify. And um, 
you know, be, be mindful of that. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, your personal experience and sort of that, that discovery of what he was like, where, where was your moment of clarity where you went, aha, and, or you started thinking like, there's something wrong with this man. Yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't know there was anything wrong until two months into the marriage. Uh, I had a, I, on the last night of a delayed honeymoon, someone sent me an email in the middle of the night. I got it at 4 a.m. in the morning when I woke up, I saw that there's a message that came in and this woman emailed me via Facebook and said, so you're married to so-and-so. Well, I guess the joke's not just on me, but it's on you too. I've been dating him for the past three months. And my world was destroyed. I had this shock that I had this, as I realized that there was a world of what I thought was true. And then there was this revelation of what she was sharing of a reality that I had no idea of. And it felt like two snow globes coming together and colliding and my world shattered. And I actually dissociated for a long period of time uh, lost, almost lost consciousness in the process. And uh, as I realized that I didn't know who I had married, mm. that he was a complete stranger to me. Mm. So I'm here so we are in a hotel and a resort trying to come home. And I, and I'm in the process of moving internationally and have sold my house and everything's been sold. So my whole life was about ready to be uprooted with a start over. And I'm, I'm, and I'm leading with this devastating revelation, mm. devastating revelation. That is a devastating revelation. And yeah. walk me through the process of, of your transition from that, because I think, I don't know the entire story, just what you're sharing with me, but I think it's one that's very important because there's a lot of women, men, people in general that are like you, right? They're in the trenches. They've made these huge commitments and investments. And then wham, out of nowhere, they kind of get this, this shock of their life and they don't know which way to turn it, if they can get, how they can get out of it, what to do about it. So can you walk us um, through your process of that? Yeah, yeah, and, and what I now know, I know that what I was experiencing, there's a name for it. It's called cognitive dissonance. I was experiencing mm -hmm. just this intense shock of a dual reality, and I didn't know which reality was true. I could see both. I thought I had a sense and what life looked like with this person and who he, this person was. And then there's this information this person, new person's providing that completely contradicts the first. And so there was this two like realities list side by side. And so cognitive dissonance, the problem is we can't decide what's real because the person we're in a relationship creates the sense that both is true at the same time. He obviously had done something catastrophically horrific and betrayed me, but he kept, kept saying he was a good guy working really hard, wanted us to work out, which is true. I don't know what's true. And so it causes this incredible paralysis that's agonizing. Now, at the time, I didn't know any of this. It's interesting. Again, here is I'm a psychologist. I've had 20 years plus practice. Uh, I had all this education and continue education and I never heard of cognitive dissonance outside of making a decision about whether or not to, what we have for lunch today. Yep. Do I have a salad or do I have a hamburger? <laughs> you know, that's the extent that it's discussed. I, I even went to a program, uh, my graduate training program talked a lot about personality disorders. I had entire classes spent on personality disorders, which is much more than most graduate students in Absolutely. psychology get. So I had all this excessive or special training, and yet we didn't talk about what happens to individuals in the context of an emotionally abusive relationship. There is this, this idea out there, it, it, and it is that the, the domestic abuse violent victim looks like a codependent, people-pleasing person who comes out of a dysfunctional home. And the reason they're not functioning well and making bad decisions is because of this history, this, this adverse childhood history. What we haven't really been focusing much on is that destructive personalities and relationships 
cause devastation to well-functioning people. Absolutely. And fortunately, I'm so thankful for the work that Sandra L. Brown's doing. She did this big, huge study of 600 sub subjects of pathological love relationships and found that well-functioning individuals pre the relationship looked poor functioning as the relationship progressed. Now, I didn't know any of this at the time. This is, you know, I know this now in hindsight, but I didn't know it at the time. So I do what any good therapist would do who discovers this catastrophic information. I reach out to try to find help. I contact, uh, he, he claimed he had a sex addiction. Never heard of that either because a DSM-5 doesn't, or at the time for me, it was a DSM-4, right. didn't recognize it. So it wasn't something it was in my vernacular that I was familiar with. But uh, I, I began to, I knew there were certified sex therapists and there were certified sex addiction therapists. So I began to reach out and try to find someone to help us. And that's the first thing I did. Got in and saw a therapist who gave him an assessment who then who said in our first meeting, you have, that he had a severe sexual addiction and it would take months of treatment. And here we are, have we have tickets to leave for another country and our house is sold and we're living in a, you know, an Airbnb while we're waiting for our airplane, you know, our flights to go to the new country. <laughs> and I'm hearing that he needs months of residential treatment, which I know because I used to work at psychiatric facilities because there's no uh, code, no diagnosis for sex addiction. This is going to be all out of pocket. Um, and I already know roughly how much this is going to possibly cost. And I'm floored. I just feel like it's like one bad news after another bad news. And and I'm on this this journey that I like a train I can't get off. I, I I know this move is coming, and I know this new country doesn't have supports, and I don't know who I'm married to, and I don't know how to get off the train. You know, you said something that's very interesting to me, and you said that this woman contacted you via Facebook and told you this. But what was striking to me about that was you believed her. Oh, she gave and, she gave evidence okay well and i and i'm not um i'm not saying that there's anything wrong with believing her however i know that and i'm sure you probably have encountered people that you know when they're sort of in the love bubble yeah right they're not willing to they're in such a state of denial they're not really they're not really uh ready or willing, ready or willing to hear that information. Was there something for you that made you like, let, let me see what this is about. Let me see what this woman is talking about. Let me go down this rabbit hole and let me just hear this person out. I, yeah, I did. I did speak to her briefly and I was trying to assess her rapidly. What was her agenda? She obviously had an agenda. I suspect I knew the agenda. Uh, I suspect because he'd been, we had limited our outside contact with other people that he was hard to get. She wanted to get him another way and wanted to hurt me. So this was an effort for her to re sort of attach with him and get back in good with him. But what she did that was really, I, I think it was, I, I appreciate her doing it, but it, it increased the validity of what she was saying is that she identified events that they had done that I could see how they lined up in my life and lined up with dates that made sense. And she also described things in the car that were obviously mine. And she knew, she wondered if they were mine. And she also described a gift, he, and this was to me was one of the things, in addition to the fact that I just found that he had been sleeping with another woman. The, the other thing she described is he had put the wedding gift I had given her on her wrist and offered to let her keep it. And she described the inscription on the inside of it. Oh, it was, I was a wedding gift you had given him and yeah. he gave it, he re-gifted it to her. He tried to, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm like dealing with this massive, I'm, I feel like someone had just taken a huge sword and I'm bleeding to death. That's what I felt like. I, to hear this, this uh, casualness, the way he treated my efforts to love him and show love and we hadn't had a good honeymoon anyway it was already had had rough moments he had started I didn't again I was unfamiliar with the abuse tactics of narcissistic abuse but he had already started 
to uh, really clearly put my myself in, in a place to he started to punish me psychologically during that doing a lot of gaslighting with me and uh, so I you know it was the first time I'd spent a, an extended period of time with him since we'd met other than yeah it really it was I mean we had 10 days together like nonstop, and I so he was starting to become more emotionally abusive so all of this sort of was just Oh, yeah. And I didn't even tell you the biggest piece. The biggest piece I was on our honeymoon night in, in lieu of having intimacy. I he he opted out to watch porn. I caught him watching porn. So her her disclosure was just sort of a, like a tumbling of one bad thing after another. So mm -hmm. I wasn't so focused on her or her agenda because there had already been I was being introduced to how very abusive this relationship and that's was. what i was wondering about was there something already in the works for you that had yes. kind of made you like ready to hear it even though you had just gotten married um yeah. because it sounded like you know you were you were already kind of questioning some yeah. of the things in the relationship yeah, and here's the hard part, Dr. Jones, is that, and I know I'm not alone, and and I know the oh, outside yeah. world, uh, yeah. in fact, I get a lot of criticism for this about my book. I wrote a book about it called Love You More, and, and, and interestingly, I'm not rated a five-star on it, and the reason is because people don't like the fact that I stayed as long as I did. I get all sorts of criticism for being a doormat in the book, but what's really hard for the outside world to understand is that this is really like a frog in cold water that then becomes boiling. It's a slow process. Yeah, there's a lot of catastrophic events, events that we share, but you, people don't also realize there's all this other confusing messages of, I'm really trying hard and I've never worked so much or I've never loved someone like you and you and I have something special and you have all these other mixed messages. It isn't like somebody is just bad, 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 bad. It's that they, they do this very confusing mix of bad and good absolutely and, and now i on the other side understand what's their motivation is about and it makes sense but when you when you have an assumption that the world's a good place and people generally are well-meaning even though broken and that for most of us are on a course of wanting things to get better see that already i mean as much as i love that mindset but when you're with a predator that isn't true and i didn't realize there are real predators in the world oh, and yeah. I had married one. Absolutely. And, you know, I think the good thing about what you mentioned is even though you had training, it you didn't really know what to look for. And, and a lot of people, you know, a lot of people often, you know, sort of get on psychologists or get on therapists about, you know, working with sociopaths or not being able to see it. And the reason being is because it, does not look like your classic textbook and unless you have experience working with these types of people and just really being in the trenches it's very hard to see reason being they blend in they look they act sometimes and speak sometimes like regular folks they could be very good looking they could be very stylish they could have money you know, they could be anything. And so it's not easy, you know, and if, if you haven't done it, and even if you have done the work, I think this is another caveat and hopefully it's not one that you've beat yourself up for. But even if, even if you've done the work, it's being a person that spent years being kind and compassionate, you don't want to believe that the person that you're in bed with, the person that you're planning the future with, um, you don't want to believe that they're a bad person. Right, right, right. Yeah, pe we, we severely underestimate the sophistication of sociopaths. I think psychopaths, I, I know people like, why would you split them? There's only the antisocial personality disorder and the DSM-5. I do think that they're two different groups. And Absolutely. I, and then, they also say, well, then they're all narcissists. No, no, they're no, not. They're I actually not. have met those who are not narcissistic at all. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have in my family, sadly, psychopathy, psych psychopathy runs in my family. Mm -hmm. My grandmother was probably one. My father had some tendencies. I've seen it. 
they weren't nurse, narcissistic, but they could be very ruthless and, and very entitled. So anyway, that's, but he's a sociopath in the sense I do believe he was made. He was more reactionary, more impulsive. But here's what threw me off. I'm very familiar with faking emotions. Yes. I, I can, I mean, I spent years watching people's body languages and knowing what people are saying and what they're not saying or what they're trying to say or what they're feeling, all of that. He actually had panic attacks in front of me. They were real panic attacks. You can't mm. fake having someone's body body sweat and shake the way that yeah. his would or the way he would emote around things were authentic emotions and and very tender everyone that met him in my life liked him he made a very good first impression what i think through me as well as most people who meet him is that there is this this interior world inside of him that is extremely calculating and opportunistic and ex very egocentric so that it's always about his best advantage and he assumes no one is on him, his side you're never on his side so there's this ruthless calculation that's going on despite this emotion that seems very genuine and connecting but if you watched what he, i would get back from him see that's what i was i was ignoring it wasn't he want he loved when i was emotionally close to him but when it came to me being emotionally needy, then there was this glib or shallowness, superficiality, or lack of empathy for me. But I, I failed to see there was not this reciprocity. I failed to, I ignored that. And I imagine there was a reason for that because maybe you had, you know, gone through other relationships or other periods of time where you were the one that you know took care of people and your needs weren't necessarily met which yeah. is often the case yeah for healers and things of that nature exactly yeah and it, i do think there are people who are narcissistic and then they they abuse their partner because they're just selfish people thoughtless people and then i think there are people who are actually offenders who are predators who uh -huh. are looking for people see people as as resources as as consumable and they're moving through people like it's consumable so i sort of see the whole group of the narcissistic abuse realm and sort of big two large groups the ones yes. who are just stepping all over people like a bull in a china shot and then those who are actually on the look and yeah. and w looking for new people new marks that's who i met i met someone who is looking uh, and who's actively moving through people um but I, I didn't appreciate that. And, 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 and this is the part that was really hard for me. I've had to take some very deep look into my own biases about relationships, the, the assumptions I make. And one of them was that I've now know I've had to rechange is that uh, my contentment and what makes me feel safe should never reside in the context of a relationship or in another person. It needs to reside within me. But I had been raised to believe that's what happens in a yes. relationship. That that's what a good woman is what a good wife is and that a good man will do these things for her so i kept putting all this energy thinking if i could fix the relationship then i could make myself safe not realizing no my safety is my responsibility not the relationship's responsibility mm. that's a good one and it's one that people often struggle with when did you find out or when would did it sort of dawn on you that there was some psychopathy in this individual. You mentioned the, the porn and the sex addic addiction. When did you discover, or when did you have the epiphany for yourself that there's, this person is in a relationship with me, but his intentions with me are not well-meaning? yeah it wasn't until a year in so here we're doing all this therapy work trying to get help and i he's i'm he's continuing to there's more discoveries and finding out that his there's a, another person who's been a girlfriend of long standing who exists out here that he's in communication with i keep i'm finding out he's conversations with strangers that he's sexually hit on hitting on and text messages i'm just discovering this person is very predatory when it comes to sexual opportunities and i didn't realize it so we keep yeah. trying to rescue him rescue him he acts like he wants to be rescued i think we're doing that but i can tell things are falling apart and getting worse so finally i just have had it and and uh, it was in the summer of 2018 i get up and walk out and say, i'm done i i think you're done i'm done i can't do this anymore i don't i, I don't get what's happening 
And so we begin to, um, but here's the part, <laughs> Dr. Jones, that's really, you know, you think it's really bad and then you discover, oh no, there's even worse. So what had happened is I had moved to a new country and we set up a business and, and the, comp the country's attorneys had helped me set up the business, but they didn't know English very well and I didn't know the language. So I'm not negotiating how the setup of the company is. And it, it needs to have officers and it can't just be, um, I, I make him the other office. It has to be at least two officers in this company. And they want us to set up roles and they don't describe to me the powers that are included in this role. I don't even know to ask what powers. You know, I don't know that there's administrative powers and there's financial powers and there's who owns the capital. I don't know all of that. So they asked me what percentage are we sharing this company? Here I am marrying this guy when I set this up. You want it to be 50-50, right? I mean, you think like we're gonna, you know, this is it, we're doing this, we're gonna run this business together. It's a joint business. So I make him 50-50% owner while I though, however, capitalize the company. It's all my assets, 100%. So here we are now, a year into this, we've been building this thing, it's been getting larger, and, and I'm done, and I said, you know, I'm thinking in my head, okay, I, I can be reasonable, he can have a job, part of this over here, and have a salary, because the company's been his livelihood, as well as it's been mine, he can have this asset, and this asset, and I'm thinking all this through, and I said, so what do you think, and I'm thinking, he's going to be fair, this is going to be really, be why would he not be fair, I mean, it's been so helpful, I don't know why, I, I somehow <laughs> thought that, just because he's sexually, you know, uh, promiscuous doesn't mean yeah. though that he would be financially irresponsible. Yes. He's not yeah. so far the way he ran everything. I mean, he was a manager, a supervisor. He did a good job. It wasn't well, like there's... I like the way you're explaining it because, and that's why I ask these questions because I think the way that you were thinking is the way a lot of us think when we're in these types of relationships because we have not seen that side of that person that's unpredictable or that can really. Yeah. Uh, get things cracking with us. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. so yeah, I like, yeah, I like we assume that there's ethics, you know, yeah. we see, you know, I, I knew there was no ethics yeah. when it came yeah. to the marital side of things. Yeah. I understood that, but I, I hadn't seen anything that suggested a lack of ethical ethics when it came to running a business. None. I didn't. So I assume, and he always said he was never in the relationship for the money. He never said that. He, I mean, he actively said he was not. So we, so he says, well, well, let's sit down after this next meeting and talk about it. Now, this guy loves a moment. He loves making a moment. And it's all about the show, you know, the pomp and circumstance. He takes a lined piece of paper, writes out the names of the, what the company assets are and their current retail values are. He does this whole thing. Like, I don't already know this in my head. Why do we need to do this? It's a stage and it's a trade. He adds them up at the bottom, divides it by two, points to it and says, by law, I have a right to that. Hmm. I had no idea, one, that that was true. No idea he was capable of this and couldn't believe that this person knew that as a widow and as a person who'd spent all these years trying to get where I was in life and out of, out of tragedy had what I had, and he felt he had a right to whatever I had brought in and built for this company that he had a right to have just because, just because. And then he says this final thing to sort of top it all off with a cherry. He looks at me and he says, divorce has never been fair to me. Why should it be fair to you? How many times had he been divorced? He'd been divorced four times. I know. And as and again, you're like, why, why, Sherry, <laughs> would you gotten in a relationship with somebody like that? Because he said he had understood it. He'd shared with me this paradigm shift that I thought he had made this. Well, he had had a revelation. Again, I what I failed to miss was the superficiality of the description. It sounded good, but it wasn't. There wasn't. I didn't. I didn't catch. There was not a lot of personal ownership when he described what went wrong. He said, I wasn't interviewing the women. I was impulsive. I made rapid decisions. I don't want to do it again. I want to take a lot of time and get to know you. I want to build this on something. I mean, it sounded good when we were, you know, I first met him. And so, so again, you know, and then you say to yourself as a clinician, you say, well, don't people, don't do people deserve other chances? Have we ever seen stories where I know of a person, see right now, I feel like sort of, it makes you feel defensive, you know, but don't I knew, be. Don't yeah, be. But I I knew of a guy though. who, <laughs> yeah, I knew of a guy who was a delinquent, a horrible life, ended up in prison and he's the most wonderful man you'd ever meet. He's in his seventies and he's really helping people mentoring and he's really turned it around. But if you'd met him in his thirties, I mean, it would be yeah so i you know i knew of those and i thought well is it judgmental of me to 
not assume this can't happen here, but you know, my bias was no, I didn't want that. That was to me very, it was a bad track record anyway. So yeah, that was when I knew. So of course I went right out and saw an attorney. I went back to the attorney that firm that set the, the company up. They also had a divorce wing and she said, yeah, well, yeah, you're right. That is the law. He's absolutely right. Have you been breaking no, the law? If he's not no. been breaking a law, he has a rap, he right to half of it. So there I was now in another country without a good command of the language, trying to run a business without, you know, understanding the language. And now I'm divorcing as somebody who wants to strip half of it out, which is he didn't earn any of that or deserve any of that or was his, any of his to bring in. And it's going to devastate me financially. And there I am. And that's when I kind of I knew that I was in I was really with my shift. My view of him shifted. I knew this was not a good guy. This was an opportunist. Okay. It gets um, worse though. I learn more after the whole thing's over, you know, but uh, yeah. So what I learn, but when it's all over and sudden done, and I learn this when I'm interviewing his other wives for the, for the book, I get sick in the, in the marriage. I'm getting sicker, physically sicker. I have a hospitalization. I end up collapsing on an airplane and a doctor on the airplane thinks I either suffered a stroke or had a heart attack. Uh, I know I'm falling apart. My liver is now shining, showing signs of disease. My kidneys are showing problems, functioning problems. There's all sorts of these weird signs. I have white lines across all my fi fingernails. Um, I'm just, I'm falling apart. Is that poisoning? So, so I get done and I'm interviewing the wise for the, for the, for just to find this backstory, find out what's real, find out which is, was fascinating. And I, there was one woman I couldn't get a hold of. And finally, a year later, she contacts me. And, it, and I'm just interviewing her, like you and I are doing, just yeah. collecting information. She says spontaneously, I think he was poisoning me. I about dropped the phone. Yeah, so as I was that. writing the book, my, 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 my co-writers, my partners would say, I think he was poisoning you. The way you're describing it, the way your health was falling apart, it really sounds like you were being poisoned. Have you talked to somebody about that? So I did, I got a hold of a poison control nurse, described all my symptoms. She came back, yeah, that's heavy metal. You're describing yeah. heavy metal Arsenic. poisoning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Arsenic poisoning. Yeah, yeah, you can buy it in that country over the counter. Mm -hmm. It's very mm -hmm. feasible. I think what was happening, cause it's odorless and tasteless mm -hmm. uh, and you can get it in tabs. Yep. And so I think what he was doing is at night, he knew I loved mineral water with Topo Chico and some lime and he would, he would drop the tabs in. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, it was so, so because, because he, we had had a will and if I died, he stood to inherit it all. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Your symptoms sound like a dead ringer for, for arsenic poisoning. Um, that's the first thing yeah. that comes to my mind, but man. Yeah. So I, fortunately I'm, you. yeah, I was very ill for two years. I had, I would, I, I would be sent to bed with terribly GI crisis periods where nobody could understand what was happening. And they were, I had physicians here trying to figure out what was wrong with me. And thankfully it's all cleared. And in fact, my, my I don't know if my hit liver is any healthier, but my, but everything, I was starting to become diabetic. Everything's kind of reversing now and kind of going back to, again, that's a sign that I had been ingesting something. The fact that my symptoms are now going away, uh, but yeah, but yeah, I'd had a chronic exposure to some kind of poisoning agent. Um, yeah. So, so, and, th and to try to get your mind around that, that this person that said they loved you and that they'd never loved anyone like you was actually, meanwhile, handing you something that was going, hopefully was going to kill you. I mean, I, I don't, I don't even know how to, I, I, normal people don't live, like, don't do those strangely dichotomous things. It's just horrific, horrific. It is horrific. You mentioned that a lot of people, you know, frowned upon you because of how long you guys were together. How long were you together? Two years. So the, we were together for the first year. And then once I found, we took a break for a month. And then that's when I got the bigger, better picture that this person was soliciting prostitutes and involved in lots of very dark things. Um, I, and then he came back and he wanted to back in the relationship. And I, and he had been running through my money really fast. And I knew he was running out of money and that was what he was doing. I understood that, but I wanted him to sign off on the company. So I agreed with a, with the agreement that he would give me full control and that he would give up his shares to me so it took another year to get that to happen i had to i had to then move into a con game a long con game with this man 
knowing that I needed to wait for a moment with good leverage to get him to say, yes, whatever it is that you that I want from you is worth more than these shares to this company. So that was what the last year spent was, you know, hoping, still hoping. I That's the part that I feel kind of like, Here's the thing that I've now, I mean, I've really set and have come to appreciate. We all are wired for belonging. We're wired to need to be attached. There's nothing wrong with that. What what happens though is there's certain people who will use this against us. And and that's who we need to watch out for. But I spent another year hoping he would change, but meanwhile watching for my opening, watching for an opening. And it came, it came very shocking and sad and but i but i knew when it came i knew that it was the opening that i needed and that's what i tell people you need to watch for an exit get ready and then when you see it you have to jump on it you have to be ready so my opening was uh, i got a phone call from my youngest son that my oldest son was really something was really wrong he was very sick and he was back in the united states Uh, i knew it was catastrophic because he's altered he wasn't oriented times three so he didn't know what day it was or uh, he wasn't know even what time of the day it was. So I knew it was really, really serious to have that kind of neurological change. So um, by the evening, he'd been in the ICU and they, they thought he was dying. Uh, he actually, he was dying. So I flew up and he was diagnosed with leukemia. Wow. And uh, so as I was flying home, I got the news that he had cancer. Um, and I knew, you know, I having survived my husband's cancer, I knew that this was going to be a big thing another life changing thing. I knew I would have to relocate back in the United States. I knew I'd have to be in the same city as my son. And I also knew that my husband would become an ex-husband because there was no way that he was going to do this. But I also knew there was no way he could say I wouldn't, couldn't do it because culturally he had to support family. Family came first in his culture. So I knew it was like the perfect solution that he put, that I would lose him in this process. And I was okay with that. And that's what happened. And two weeks later, he fled, fled home and uh, left me in, in the United States. And then I restarted my life here. And have you heard from him since? I have um, around money, of course. <laughs> yeah. So we flew in. I mean, at that point, of course, he knew he had no income and uh, and he needed cash and he wasn't going to be able to live without me, you know, closing the bank accounts and everything. So we made it. We made a private negotiation for the company. I paid him off, and he agreed to divorce. Um, and so we we did that. And yeah, I got he got a hold of me in the pandemic and asked for more money. <laughs> and I said to him, "Why you are no you aren't anybody to me. You're not a friend even. Why would you ask me?" He said, "Well, I I should I wanted to ask for more. I really needed. It. I do do you a favor. I did, I needed to ask for more. <laughs> You're still hilarious. That still makes no sense, but." Wow. So that was my last contact with it. Actually, I had one more contact. And here's the sad thing. I don't share this much, but I will share this here. Um, it's It was hard having him walk out on me and having a son who was, was very, very like near death. But sadly, in the middle of the pandemic, I got the news that his youngest son passed away. And he then unblocked me and I could see that he was present. And I uh, he got a message through to me that uh, via family that, that that had happened, and I know he was hoping I'd reach out. There's another thing I really want to emphasize to people. Don't. Don't. They haven't changed because real remorse takes responsibility and is accountable. This is just he's hoping my goodness, my sweetness, and the fact that I almost lost a son and have lost a spouse would make him feel bad for him, and I do feel bad for him. But on the other hand, he is not good for me. There's there's no benefit for me, mm. um, and and nor would I want the relationship back in any in any way under any circumstance. So no, I did not contact him. Does he still have the ability to have access to you? No, okay. it, it, through fa- through his family, but they're very clear. I'm very careful. I have a connection with his one of his family members and uh but i'm extremely extremely careful around all of that and and do not use them as a conduit for information i don't i wouldn't want to know anything i don't want him to know anything they're they're aware that the only reason i have contact is the assumption that that's happening otherwise i won't have contact with them now can i control it no i can't but but yeah and i may rethink that if there's something that makes me feel unsafe Mm -hmm. i will definitely rethink that 
you mentioned you had a husband prior to this one that passed away. What was the amount of time that elapsed between the husband that passed away and you meeting this man? It was a year. Yeah. I, I you know, I, I got to hear there was a there's a podcast called like Dating After Gray or something like that. It's about people who are in the later stage of their life. And I was there was a physician that came on who shared about how he had a really big love of his life and then she passed away. And then he said and this for me gave me so much closure. He said, I wanted the life I had had back. I wanted to find someone I could slide into this hole this person had left. I had been with my first husband. I'd been with Brad for 31 years and knew him for 33 years. I had met him when I was 19. So we grew up together. Was it a perfect marriage? No, there was parts of it. It was kind of getting tired and we needed to do some rework, but we were getting ready for retirement. I knew I was going to throw myself into it again. Our best phases in our marriage had been when we were single. We were I'm sorry, when we were without kids, we were without kids for seven years. And I knew we were about to become empty nesters. They could really focus on ourselves and take up some hobbies together. And then that's when he was diagnosed with duodenal cancer. And so I, I felt robbed. We were, by the way, had just broke ground on a new house. We were living in a temporary house in between places. My last child was about ready to leave for college. So we were on all this big transitions and it was all gone literally within five and a half months all gone i was devastated i was i cried every day over the loss of him the upcoming loss of him so i went into widowhood screaming and kicking and wanting out as i was so angry that's one thing i wish we talked more about grief uh, i yeah. i really was unprepared for the pain of grief. And I was really unprepared for the degree that rage and anger is a big emotion in grief. No one had told me that. Yeah. I, I was so jealous, so, and you know, I, it was eating me up, destroying me. So I began to date really fast and I dated hard, meaning that I met a lot of guys looking for a certain person to sort of fit into Brad, but I wanted Brad, but Brad point two, you know, 2.0 is what I was looking for. Yeah. And then when I met this person, I didn't know anything about the strategies of love bombing that, that they recreate themselves in the moment based upon what they hear from you. And that's what he did. Uh, so when I met him, I almost saw like a checklist in my head. Oh, you know, a, a religious man, Ooh, check, same age kids, check, has same, similar retirement plans, check. I mean, he works in a similar kind of level of job, check. And I remember leaving that first date thinking, I have never met anyone more compatible. This is amazing. I didn't think this could happen because I had met maybe 40, 50 different guys up to then. And they were just very different people and looking for very different things. And so this is the first time I'd met anybody that was like that. It was intoxicating, but not real. Now I know it was, that's not who he is. I didn't meet him. I don't even know who he is, honestly. Absolutely. And I also think that grief is very important, um, especially when you're talking about narcissistic abuse, because I do think the people who are grieving, and I think, you know, if you've, you know, if you've been in a marriage seven, eight, nine, 15, 20 years, I think this is even longer, but I think anytime that you're going through some grief, whether it's ambiguous loss or physical loss, you are more susceptible to sort of be roped in and be manipulated. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. He said something in the first date that was, he said a, a big tip off Two two of them that were, I should have heard and I didn't hear, I heard them. And here's the other interesting thing. I heard them and I repressed them. I literally psychologically repressed them and forgot I'd heard them because it was so uncomfortable until it was all over. And then I had this big epiphany and remembered that like what happens with repression when it comes back, you're like, how could I have ever forgotten this? Oh my goodness, that's, you know. But the first thing he said on the date was, I've, I've been researching widows. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're a widow and you know that it's a unique experience and you don't know many people your age and it's outside, I mean, I only one in 200 women are, you know, lose a spouse in their early fifties. It's just not a very super common thing. So I felt very outside my social, my social you know, setting, my social environment. It felt sensitive. I thought, oh, how sweet. He's trying to understand me. No, no. What he was telling me, he was 
searching for a target. The target was a widow. I, but I, again, that just wasn't the worldview. The other thing he did was at the end of the, it was a, over, it was not overnight. We did not spend the night together, but he, he spent, he came, flew in and then left the next day. And I picked him up to take him back to the airport the next day. And as he, when we, he picked me up, he got kind of amorous and he said to me, I'm surprised I want you so much. And I should have heard this guy's not sexually interested in me. He's not attracted to me. And it surprises him. He feels anything. Why would someone say that? I should have, if you put that all together, that feels, again, odd, suspicious. But I didn't hear that. I just heard this as someone who I thought, I took it as, oh, he's finding me more attractive than he thought he would. See, again, I switched it. So one of the things I've, I really urge people these days is listen to what someone says. People can't stop from telling them on themselves. They do tell you things they and do. we need to hear it and take it seriously. Like if somebody on a first date says, well, I don't really know if I ever really want to live with someone again, then they're telling you they don't plan to do that. Take that seriously. Don't think, hope you're going to convince them. Or he's, one of the other things he said to me was, I really don't need anyone. I should have heard that he means it. He does not need anyone. Mm -hmm. But we hear these things and we think, oh, but I'm different. There's more where our narcissism mm -hmm. gets in the way. Yeah. I can somehow change this person and make them want me. No, 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 no. They just told you a rule for their life. Take it serious. Mm -hmm. And no one in your family had any doubts about this man. No not of my only friend who did i had one friend and then when i was in crisis she didn't know how to show up very well um which would, would have helped if she'd known how to show up but only one friend who had never met him says he's the con artist carrie but i how would she know that she never met him didn't know anything about it hadn't even seen a photo of him didn't know to me it was not on, i mean i couldn't make it credible that she didn't know what she was basing it on did but you she, find out later what she based that on no, because her and I kind of lost, you know, parted ways over, and then plus my life, it took me in a different course. So I never really heard what she, I think she based it on, here's, here's why I threw it out, because she's a very individualistic, independent woman, and can have really hard, hard standards for people. Yeah. So I figured, yeah, well, but she's kind of biased that way. And so, and she's been burned, and she's sort of seen that, and, and that maybe that's just her framework of the world. That's how I assumed it. Okay. But anyone who met him in person, no, 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 no. Mm -mm. And I even, one of my good friends is a therapist and he didn't send any vibes off to her either. Wow. Interesting. How did you, how did you financially recover? So I think that's a big thing for a lot of people that, you know, they get with these folks that financially ruin or devastate them. If I had been in there longer, he would have, and he did, but he, he didn't, he hurt, he wounded me, but he, he has not, he did not ruin That's my good. financial life, which is the benefit. Yeah. So fortunately that was what I was sort of was able to soften the, so it wasn't as bad as it could have been. Um, yeah, so I'm fine. I'm fine. And then I want to come back. So that's my, where I'm at with it. One of the things I hope is that to sort of reclaim what was lost, but but I'm, I'm okay. But I know that's not often not the case. And, and I know that if I've been there any longer that I would have compromised myself that way. So that's, that's a kind of something I, so one of the things I've discovered is that there are certain personalities that predators really are attracted to. And they are people who score high on the big five personality mm -hmm. inventory tests with agreeableness and conscientiousness. Um, I'm high on agreeableness, but I'm almost, I'm super high on conscientiousness. So what it means is that I'm open, I'm flexible, I'm a good team player, I like to get along with people, I'm very, work well with others, I'd like to make sure that everybody feels accommodated. And conscientiousness means that I have a strong internal moral compass of my own, doesn't mean I, ha I agree with anybody else outside of me, but I run from my a strong personal standard and I believe in social justice, that things, there are right things and wrong things and I take a stand for that. So what happens is they use these things against us because this makes mm. us long suffering, mm. makes us very hardworking, we're very loyal. 
And the sad thing is we're also more uh, uh, at risk to the effects of cognitive dissonance. So it does more neurological damage to this group than it does to the average group. Isn't that awful? Yeah. They're more susceptible to the impact of cognitive dissonance. So one of the things I have a hard time with and I need to become firmer is to know my own boundaries. And even though someone pushes it slightly and that's what they'll do, they don't, they don't usually do the grand pushes. Like uh, let's, I use a common one that's a simple one. I don't text after 7 p.m they won't text at 10 p.m. and then want to know why you didn't take the text. They'll text at 7.01 p.m. and then want to know why you can't make an exception. That's how manipulation works. They start out with something small. Yes, and, and then if you far. think, yes, mm -hmm. and your reasonableness, you think, well, that is kind of harsh. Good grief, it's only one minute after. It's not like with five hours after. But what you don't know is the minute you'd given that millimeter, because you don't want the ding against your own sense of yourself, because it feels like a betrayal to you, you're a yeah. good person, that now it's gonna go a mile, two miles, a hundred miles, which is what will happen, they'll take it out. So, so one of the things is I need to know that I always need to protect myself, always. Absolutely. Physically, financially, uh, emotionally, spiritually, I need to have these rules. And, and even if someone says, yeah, but that's not nice or it doesn't seem fair or how come life took this break for you it doesn't mean that i'm obligated to rescue them or to accommodate in a way that would later injure me and that's the see another nine mindset i haven't had because i was really raised with i was raised in a christian home and we really was taught G joy is jesus first others second and you last it sounds yeah. beautiful until you look at what that looks like practically and at a practical level if you do that and you come out of a, a deficiency place all the time, you're giving out, then there eventually you, there is nothing to give anymore. But you I think to... part of that is you have to look behind that Jesus first. And Jesus typically, and I'm, I'm raised in a very Southern style home too, mm -hmm. Jesus or God is usually man or the father. Mm -hmm. So that means that man always comes first. Yeah. 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 My, my dad would walk in the house and my mom would jump and get him a cup of coffee. And then she would hover and not sit and relax until he was, he was filled and full and good, happy. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. So I think it's part of it is like deconstructing yes. what people are really saying when they say God or Jesus or, yes. you know, because I think a lot of that is really just speaking for this man the man should always be the priority and yes. be be first and be the the first person you consult with and get the approval from exactly which then sets you up perfectly for a very toxic relationship if you're mm -hmm. in with someone who's dangerous mm -hmm. i mean i think the paradigm you know if you, they say well christ loved the church gave his life for her and therefore if we you know he laid his life down and therefore you can give back that sounds beautiful but it, but you need to have that reciprocity. If the Absolutely. reciprocity is there, then it's just abusive. This is a dominating relationship and that it's abusive. It's not reciprocally submissive. That's really what was being described mm -hmm. in there. But again, I didn't know that. And you're right. It, 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 this has forced me to reconstruct a lot of what I believe about relationships, a lot of what I believe about myself, a lot of believe what I believe about God, but also what I believe about men and women's relationships. It's well, really let me ask me you to... about that, because what's life like for you in relationships now, having had this experience with men? Yeah, I, so I started dating pretty fast afterwards, uh, and then started to realize that I just was start not feeling safe. I, I found that my hands were shaking when I was starting to text somebody that I found maintaining boundaries really hard and tricky that I was feeling like I was again, I could feel the pull to make this person a primary person even well, we don't even have a relationship. I don't even know this person. I'm already feeling this, this obligatory sense of this relationship with somebody that it's not really a relationship. So I took a pause. So I've not, I've not pursued, looked for, talked to I, nothing for 18 months. Um, and it's been very peaceful. And instead, what I focused on is I've been focusing on my my adult relationships with my three sons. I have three sons, and they're in their the early 30s to late 20s. We are close. We right after their dad died, we kind of 
the family constellation sort of was really stressed. We struggled with each other, but we've come back together and we've become friends. The, the three of the four of us have become dear friends and, and they're men. See, so I get to have a relationship with adult men in a different way. Yeah. It's mom, son, but it's, but we have real dialogue. We set limits. We we negotiate things. So I'm that's where I'm practicing. I'm practicing having a healthy relationship with a man through my sons. What do they think about all this? Yeah, that was the biggest piece. I had a moment. Um, I had a moment with both my oldest and my youngest who were living in this area first. Now all th all my family lives in the same area. I'm actually roommates with my middle son. We we are roommates. We're not mother son relationship. It's a roommate relationship, okay. and uh, it's very sweet. He cooks for me. Isn't that sweet? He takes care of all the food and groceries and everything. Anyway, so I had this moment where I sat down with him. I was telling him an update was happening in this company that I still own, and uh, and I I said to him, you they, you must be terribly ashamed of me that I could have been so duped like this. And I started to, to weep. And then the oldest looked at me and he's, he's a very strongly opinionated person, very done very well with his life. And he said, no mom, no mom, he used your best qualities against you. This isn't on you, this is on him. He used your best qualities against you. And then he came over and he hugged me and said, you don't need to be, please mom, there's no shame here. There's no shame. That's sweet. Yeah. It's very so, understanding, very emotionally mature. They are. They are. We've gone through a lot. I mean, the oldest now is in remission from leukemia, thank goodness. We've had a, you know, we've, we're, I'm so thankful for that. We, we treasure every day being close to death now twice has changed us, made us view yeah. life very different, make us appreciate Absolutely. the present moment. Um, and uh, it's, yeah, so that's, that's been so helpful. So helpful. Okay. Well, Dr. Carey, we've come to the end. This was wonderful, Dr. Jones. Right. So nice to meet you. And I it's nice to meet you. you. And it's been so informative. And I really appreciate your candidness. And I tell you why, because um very much like what you said in terms of how people responded to you in the book, you know, when you wrote your book. It's very hard to to um, admit that you made some decisions and you trusted or you you did this you know people just don't get it you know and there's a lot of judgment in the world can be very just like well you kind of deserve that or you were stupid or you're you know you're yeah. this and so it almost makes you like afraid to really put yourself out there but I, I you know you're you're like a kindred spirit to me and I totally it, you know everything that you said I definitely resonate with because you know I I I can sympathize with it because I've also been in some situations with relationships where it has cost me dearly and I feel so stupid for lack of a better word after and I'm, and I know that there's you know a bajillion people out there that will listen to this and say oh my goodness she's speaking my language so so thank you for doing that because I know that that's not easy yeah I I and I've really come to see that any of the criticism that we all get is because nobody wants to be hurt no the anger at us for getting for at least for me for being in this relationship is because they're over identifying with the vulnerability and they don't want me to be vulnerable so they know that they cannot they won't be vulnerable either mm -hmm. but here's the thing is that we are we are but we just need to keep learning and doing better and and realizing the way in which we approach the world and and make people earn our trust but but we will get hurt i mean you can't take risks in belonging you can't belong have a sense of belonging if you don't be aren't you vulnerable and genuine it, it takes that but Absolutely. and we occasionally will meet a really awful person don hennessy in his book how he gets into her head says we shouldn't brag when we've not met a a, a sophisticated offender he said it's it's not that you have all that great of boundaries or that you're all that together you just haven't met a good enough one yet yes yeah Yep. They're out there. We just need they to get are. better at spotting them and then protecting ourselves. And so that's what I've made my platform about. Good. I appreciate that. Can you tell folks how to reach you and if there's, um, you know, if they want to connect with you after hearing what you had to say, and then, you know, if you're working on anything that we can support you with. 
Oh, thank you. Yes, absolutely. I'm on most social media platforms at Carrie McAvoy PhD, just all kind of put together, Carrie McAvoy PhD. My book, Love You More, The Harrowing Tale of, of Lies, Sex Addiction, and Double Cross, tells about this marriage, what happened and how I got out and the details about that. Right now, I'm finalizing uh, the an online course with a companion workbook and journal called First Steps to Leaving a Narcissist. It's a guide to helping people resolve the cognitive dissonance, resolve the duality, the confusion, the, the stuckness, the paralysis they feel. So it actually, it kind of works like a therapy appointment. So it, it's through seven different modules will take you through identifying what the problem is, help you begin to re-see it in a new way, and then work through it so that you can break the confusion. And that will be coming out November 1st. I'm super I excited about it. I'm excited too so thank you so much for sharing and i appreciate you coming on thank you thank you this has been wonderful <laughs> all right so i'd love to know what you think if you're following me on social media please be sure to let me know your thoughts if you want to hit uh if you want to send me an email and let me know your thoughts the email and all of that good stuff is down in the show notes but i really love the interview and how transparent uh, Dr. McAvoy was with all of us. And, um, you know, it really takes a special person to sort of just lay it out there, um, you know, and talk about it. And I'm so grateful that she did and, and learned a lot from her. And hopefully you did too. And so until next time, guys, take care of yourselves and be well. Check out the sneak preview of next week's episode. Well, when I'm working with some with a couple where there's a partner with issues of narcissism, mm -hmm. I'm usually working with the whole system. So I'm okay. doing individual work with each of them and doing some intermittent work with them conjointly, mostly to be able to observe their interplay, to observe their ability to communicate, express their experiences with one another. So I'm watching and then I'm working with them individually. The individual work with the offended partner mm -hmm. is usually a lot of strength building, self-esteem building, coaching, really helping them to find the language. I mean, the, the secret formula here, I guess, or not so secret formula in schema therapy, and one that I've elaborated over time is empathic confrontation. So it's mm -hmm. how do you take on this posture of being someone who is very knowing but still confronting so it's something like i know you didn't mean to be hurtful i know that's not your intention but ouch you know it hurts when you talk that way 